Hello everyone! In this video we'll be covering chapters 5 and 6. I meant to record this video earlier this week, however, I didn't get to it until today, which is somewhat convenient as it does go along with what is currently happening related to the GameStop stock, Wall Street, and the Reddit investors, Wall Street Bets. And so hopefully this video will kind of help to explain or define some issues that we're currently seeing related to all of that. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. In chapter five, we'll be talking about the healthcare economy, but some of the terms we will be referencing do relate to what kind of happened with the whole fiasco that occurred earlier this week. So, economics of healthcare, firstly, we'll be talking kind of about, you know, what is healthcare? We defined it here as goods and services, Prescription drugs, consultations with doctors, surgeries, etc. They're intended to maintain or improve a person's health. Obviously, health expenditure is really important to discuss related to the economy. Healthcare expenditure in the U.S. is higher than anywhere else in the world. Um... In the last couple centuries, there have been some incredible advances in health outcomes, improvements in nutrition, public health mo movements related to sanitation, food distribution, etc. Most of these gains have occurred in the 20th century, increases in life expectancy, corresponding decrease in death rate. Some of these things can be shown using the link to Gapminder that I will send out in my weekly email. So I would definitely recommend going and taking a look at some of those visual models to kind of see, you know, how GDP life expectancy is related and some other variables. There are some important differences between the healthcare systems of the US and other countries related to who provides for the healthcare and who pays for it. Most healthcare in the US is provided by private firms paid through health insurance. Health insurance here just defined is a contract between a buyer a contract under which a buyer agrees to make payments or premiums in exchange for the provider agreeing to pay all or some of the medical bills. Healthcare itself is a normal good, which means that higher income leads to a higher expenditure on healthcare. There's also some insurance payments in the form of fee for service where doctors and hospitals receive a payment for each service they provide, or there's also HMOs, health maintenance organizations, where doctors receive a flat fee per patient that they treat. So about half of the people in the US receive health insurance through their employer, while about 35% receive it through government programs. The proportion of Americans without health insurance is lower now than in recent years, partly because of the Affordable Care Act. However, a lot of people still don't have health insurance, and there are a lot of reasons for that related to the ability to afford it. And also some people believe they just don't need it because they're healthy. Okay. Another thing to note is that there are other healthcare systems in comparison countries. This isn't an international healthcare economics course, so we're not going to get too much into the other healthcare systems, but 
in like in Canada, there's a single payer health care system where the government provides health insurance to everyone. It's funded through taxes. Private companies provide the care, though, so individuals don't pay anything out of pocket. There's also universal health care systems where every resident's required to enroll in nonprofit health insurance or enroll in government program health insurance. Co-payments may be substantial in that case. And then there's also socialized medicine, a system under which the government owns the hospitals and employs most of the doctors. So there are different systems in different countries. There's a lot of different arguments as far as, you know, which one serves people the best. And I would say if you're very interested in that topic, do dig into it, take a healthcare econ course specifically, um, and research that on your own. Okay. So let's talk about information problems and externalities in the market for healthcare. And this actually applies to all different types of markets, not just healthcare. Healthcare market, as well as some other markets, can be characterized by asymmetric information, which is a situation in which one party to an economic transaction has less information than the other party. This can lead to market failure, the inability of the market to maximize economic well-being. There are two main forms of asymmetric information, adverse selection and moral hazard. Okay, so... Our two main forms down here, adverse selection and moral hazard. Adverse selection is the situation in which one party to a transaction takes advantage of knowing more than the other party. And moral hazard is the actions people take after entering into a transaction that make the other party to the transaction worse off. Okay, so when we talk about adverse selection, the most famous economics example that is talked about is what's called the Lemons problem. The Lemons problem refers to the issue of asymmetric information between the buyer and the seller. It was explained by George Akerlof in the 1960s um, in a paper called The Market for Lemons, Quality, Uncertainty, and the Market Mechanism. He was a professor and economist at UC Berkeley. And so the example involved uses used cars to illustrate this concept. The lemons problem exists for both consumers and business owners. And so what happens is when you go to purchase a used car, the potential buyer of the used car can't easily determine what the true value of the vehicle is. So they may be willing to pay no more than, let's say, an average price, which is perceived to be between the bargain price and a premium price, right? Although paying an average price may at first appear to kind of offer the buyer some degree of financial protection from the risk of buying a lemon or a used car that is not high quality, a lemon is a poor quality used car, really the situation favors the seller because... Receiving an average price for a lemon car would still be more than the seller could get if the buyer had the knowledge that the car was a lemon. So in layman's terms, the seller of the used car has more information about the quality of the car, whether or not it's been involved in a flood or a car wrecks or has bad gasoline lines inside of it than the buyer would know. So the buyer is at a disadvantage here. They're unable to actually determine what a fair price of the vehicle is because they don't know all of the information. Okay. I 
Ironically, the lemons problem, it creates a disadvantage for the seller of a premium vehicle. So if a used car is of high quality, because the potential buyer and resulting fear of the buyer in, in getting stuck with a lemon car means they're not going to be willing to offer a premium price for a vehicle of superior value. Okay. So, if you want to know more about the lemons problem, I would suggest looking it up and you'll be able to understand it better. But hopefully that kind of explained adverse selection in a way. So, in order to cope with adverse selection, specifically in the healthcare market, health insurance companies try to lessen its impact by excluding some pre-existing conditions, which is a very controversial decision. Um, an alternative way to to kind of get around adverse selection would be to mandate that individuals carry insurance. So for example, many states require automobile accident insurance. Okay, so let's kind of move on from adverse selection and talk about moral hazard. So an example of moral hazard still related to cars would be People with car insurance might choose to drive less safely knowing that they are financially protected if they crash, right? Related to the healthcare system, people may use more healthcare when they don't have to pay full cost for it. So that means they may go to the doctor unnecessarily, they may engage in more risky behavior, accept excessive treatment options, those sorts of things. These actions cost society more without providing substantial benefits. Moral hazard can also occur when doctors change their behavior in order to adapt to the financial structure of insurance contracts. So if they are financially compensated by the number of tests or procedures they perform, they may order unnecessary tests. Um, patients may pay little out of pocket for the additional care if they are likely to agree to extra treatment. This eventually turns into what's called the principal agent problem, which is a problem in which Agents, such as the doctors, may pursue their own interests rather than the interests of the principals or patients that hire them. So insurance companies must delegate decision-making power to the doctor as far as, you know, what tests need to be performed, what procedures should be performed, etc. But the doctors may not have the same interest as the company in mind. So I'm not trying to bash on do doctors. I'm just kind of bringing that up as an example since we are talking about healthcare. So doctors may not participate in moral hazard because they actually genuinely care for their patients. And um, they also want to avoid malpractice lawsuits. One key to coping with this moral hazard problem is to make sure that people don't change their behavior too much. So for patients, that may include having patients pay deductibles or coinsurance, and doctors may receive standardized payments for particular illnesses. Although these methods may reduce moral hazard, it doesn't necessarily eliminate it completely. Okay, so now let's talk about adverse selection and moral hazard related to what has been going on in the stock market 
during the past few days. So if you haven't been keeping up with it, essentially what has happened is individual investors have essentially put the squeeze on a couple hedge funds that have bet or had bet that GameStop's stock shares would decrease in price. So essentially these hedge funds and money managers have been shorting GameStop shares, which means they are betting that the stock price would continue to fall. And so what retail investors in this Reddit group called Wall Street Bets did was essentially band together to buy shares and stock options of GameStop and some of these other stocks, including AMC, to drive the price up. And that in turn essentially has short squeezed these hedge funds and professional money managers and cause them to lose quite a bit of money. The market value between this past Tuesday and Wednesday rose over $10 billion for GameStop. So its market value increased to over $24 billion from $2 billion in a matter of a few days. And so this has unleashed kind of a storm of opinions related to the free market and should, you know, individual investors be allowed to collude in this way? You know, is that legal? And essentially, this is a case of moral hazard, right? So these Redditors on Wall Street Bets realized that the hedge funds were shorting these specific stocks, right? So in turn, they took action after some other people had entered into a transaction to make them worse off, right? So they saw that the hedge funds had shorted GameStop, and so they in turn went and began to buy large amounts of stock options of GameStops to drive of GameStop to drive the stock price up. So essentially they beat the hedge funds at their own game, essentially. And were able to take advantage of asymmetric information. So Obviously, this has kind of put a little bit of stress on the stock market as a whole, but it's just another example of essentially what people can do in a free market when they take advantage of knowing more information than another party does. And there also is a whole other issue related to Robin Hood one of the online brokers that a lot of kind of average people are using because they halted the ability to trade game stock game stop stock and AMC and so essentially that was market intervention and tried to prevent people from buying and selling this stock to what they say essentially to mitigate this volatility. But not going to get too much into that. If you're really interested in it, again, I encourage you to go out and research it. You can also send me some more questions if you, you know, have any questions about that. But let's continue on. So again, we're back to still talking about the healthcare market. 
essentially when there's an external cost or benefit and a wrong quantity is consumed because an external cost or benefit resulted in market failure, we have positive and negative externalities. Some externalities that are positive include the idea that vaccines, vaccinations would reduce the chance of others getting sick. We could talk about that all day related to our current COVID vaccination rollout that is occurring. Another positive externality would be an overall healthy population, which is good for employers. Fewer sick days means more people are working, which means more services are being provided, more goods are being sold, etc. Some negative externalities, poor health choices, decisions such as smoking and others are potentially paid for by the rest of the population through higher premiums and taxes, right? So as the baby boomer generation gets older, obviously they are putting more strain on the healthcare system, which does drive up the price of healthcare for them. And that in turn is passed down to us as we pay higher social security taxes. And finally, related to healthcare is the debates over healthcare policy in the US. You know, should the government run the healthcare system? Should it be privatized? You know, sh what, how do we best fix this on a policy level? If healthcare was a public good, there's a strong argument for government involvement. Is healthcare non rival in consumption? Is it non excludable? Neither of them is likely so healthcare seems to be a private good right but externalities information asymmetries they may generate enough market failure to prompt government involvement government's role in healthcare is extremely controversial and i think will continue to be controversial for quite some time okay so now let's talk and transition more into chapter six, firms, the stock market, and corporate governance, types of firms, how firms raise money, using financial statements. This isn't a finance class, but this is kind of an introduction to some vocabulary you might see in your finance classes. So, you know, why or would you invest in a company that has never earned a profit. Uh, think about Amazon. Initially, Amazon was founded in 1994. Jeff Bezos founded it then, and it didn't turn a profit until 2001. You know, why did the investors in the early days of Amazon invest in it? What did they see? Think about Tesla as well. You know, it didn't start turning a profit until recently, like this last quarter, I believe, is when they came out with their financials where they started making a profit. Um, also, Lyft is another example of an unprofitable company that investors have been valuing and trading. So, you know, we're going to talk about how these firms are run, how they're organized, how they obtain financing, um, you know, and whether they act in the best interests of their owners. So we're going to categorize firms into three types, sole proprietorship, partnership, corporation. You can read those definitions for yourself. Um, in sole proprietorships, remember there's not a legal distinction between the assets of the firm and the assets of the owner, which is quite risky, right? Um, corporations have limited liability, so that shields owners from losing more than they have invested in the firm. It also makes 
it easier for a firm to raise funds and investing in that firm is also easier for individuals. So here I just outlined or put in the chart that explains differences among business organizations. I'm not going to say that one type of business structure is better than another type of business structure. There's not a best structure out there. There's going to be benefits and costs to each type of structure, right? So think about tax planning, also liability, you know, what type of business are you involved in? Are you at more risk or are you protected? Those are all things that you need to consider when you decide, you know, if you yourself is going to start, are going to start a business or if you're going to work for a specific business. You need to understand the organizational structure. So in the U.S., about Three-fourths of firms are sole proprietorships, while just one six, one in six is a corporation. Although larger firms tend to be corporations, there is quite a bit of economically... Excuse me. Although larger firms tend to be organizations, it's going to correspond with... a significant amount of economic activity. Okay. There are fewer small firms in recent years. But small firms have generated 40% of all new jobs that have been created. There has been an increase in regulations related to licensing when starting your own business. Quite a few people in this course are business owners, and so I'm sure you've had to experience increased compliance costs, and that has discouraged young people from starting businesses. So that is just something to consider as far as the overall economy. So in sole, prior, in sole proprietorships and partnerships, owners of a firm are typically involved in the day-to-day -day activities and decisions at the firm. That's not the case for some larger organizations and corporations. Usually they're going to have separation of ownership from control in which top management rather than the shareholders controls day-to-day -day operations. So the owners are going to designate a board of directors who then appoint a chief executive officer, a CEO to oversee the day-to-day -day operations and also may pass on instructions to other members of your C-suite, your top management. Corporate governance is the way a corporation is structured and the effect that the structure has on the corporation's behavior. Although board of directors and top management in theory represent the interests of firm owners, sometimes they pursue their own agendas. Uh, Examples of this are those executives at Enron, executives at WorldCom, etc. So managers may decide to award themselves a high salary or bonuses or perks rather than doing what's best for the company and the company stockholders, including us as we own stock in our 401ks, right? So the conflict between the interests of shareholders and the interests of top management, that's what's called the principal agent problem, which we talked about earlier, right? That is not only seen in the healthcare system, but also in 
large corporations as well. Sometimes there's a conflict of interest between shareholders and the interests of top management when an agent pursues their own interest rather than the interest of those who hired them. So I'm not going to ask you to understand um, exactly how a corporation is structured, but you know you have shareholders, which include regular investors like us, also hedge funds, etc. They elect the board of directors, then who app- the board of directors appoints the top managers top managers then hire mid-level managers who hire the employees who are under them who hire the staff under them and it's a cascading effect so can the principal agent problem be resolved so a remedy for the principal agent problem related to firms is aligning the interests of both the agent and the principal. A lot of top managers are paid in part by stock options or stock in the company because their salary is tied then into the performance of the firm. So they should do what's best for the firm in order to essentially align their interests, their salary, with what's best for the firm. So the incentives can never be 100% aligned because managers only own a fraction of the firm. Okay. So now let's talk about how firms raise funds. Small, Small business owners have three primary methods, retained earnings, recruiting additional owners, or borrowing, right? So if they retained earnings, are those profits reinvested into the firm instead of paid out to the owners? If they recruit additional owners, that would increase the firm's financial capital. And if they borrow from financial institutions or from friends and family, they would then have access to more funds. Larger firms may use direct or indirect financing. We have the two definitions here. Indirect financing is through financial intermediaries who raise funds from savers to lend to borrowers. So indirect focuses specifically on the financial intermediaries and they're raising funds from savers to lend to firms, right? But direct financing, that is the flow of funds from savers to firms through financial markets. So direct financing, you're going directly to the market or a stock exchange. Direct financing involves stocks and bonds. Bonds are a promise to repay a fixed amount of funds, while stocks represent partial ownership of a firm. So that's what I'm talking about related to GameStop, the stocks, is what we're focusing on there. And so the hedge fund managers thought that the stock price would fall, and so they bet on that. But when all of the Redditors got together and started buying up stock, it drove the price up, which then caused the hedge funds to lose money. Okay. There's also um, mutual funds, exchange traded funds, ETFs, mutual funds. Um, They're actively managed funds, invest in a portfolio of assets and sell shares to investors. They can only be sold back to the management company itself. Um, Exchange traded funds, they're passively managed funds that invest in a portfolio of assets and sell shares to investors. They can be traded directly between investors. Financial securities can be traded in stock and bond markets. Keep in mind that the price a stock trades for, it 
indicates a degree of confidence in the firm's ability to make future profits since these profits are what's being used to generate return from investors. They not only include, you know, what people think future cash flows are going to be for the firm or future revenues, but they also include the economic environment around them. So part of the reason that AMC was targeted was because of the current pandemic situation we're going through right now. Movie theaters have been closed. You know, there's some concern as far as although black blockbuster hits are still being made or have the potential of still being made, there are more companies that are doing a direct release to consumers through a streaming service. So there's some concern as far as are movie theaters going to still be in business? You know, is that model company still applicable given today's current economic environment? Okay. Finally, let's talk about financial statements used to evaluate a corporation. So investment decisions can be complicated, but they can also be easy. It's important that these decisions are being based in intelligent information. Um, and so financial statements are required for publicly traded companies by the SEC, and these statements must be prepared in accordance to GAAP, Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. So by requiring that, they are standardized in a way that investors can read that information in an unbiased manner. And so investors can make the best decisions possible given the information. There are companies that specialize in selling their services to investigate these reports being created by, by these companies who analyze the stocks. So if you go into finance or you're majoring in finance, you will be asked to analyze stock in some of your upper level classes and you'll learn how to do financial modeling where you specifically input certain metrics into Excel or into other programs to analyze whether a stock is a good buy or sell based on those metrics. We have the two principal financial statements, which are the income statement and the balance sheet. You use these financials to create financial ratios that you analyze and input into your models. So here you have your income statement and your balance sheet. You learn more about those in your accounting courses. So the income statement reveals the profit that a firm makes. Profit is referred to net in, referred to as net income. It's calculated by taking the revenue minus your operating expenses and the taxes paid. Economists refer to this as accounting profit. Accounting profit is just revenue minus explicit costs. However, if we're talking about economic profit, again, economists do it different. They also include these implicit costs. What are implicit costs? They are costs that don't necessarily involve spending money. They include opportunity costs such as, you know, the time that you're putting into creating an idea. It's the highest valued alternative that must be given up. It's non-monetary. It may include the time you used in coming up with specific ideas. It could be the return you could have gotten if you had invested the money in another investment rather than pouring it into that specific business, right? So there are a lot of implicit costs to be considered in decision making. So we go back to, you know, what is economics? Economics involves making decisions given scarcity. Because we have to look at these implicit costs, 
we can see not only monetarily how something would affect a business, but also overall, what are the costs related to the time being put in, or if we had made a different decision, what kind of profit could we have made? And then finally, recent issues in corporate governance policy. Again, if you're a finance major or you have more interest in corporate governance, you can take a whole class over that. Um, accuracy and truthfulness in financial statements is critical in order to, for investors to make the best investment decisions, right? So that means the annual reports need to be done in compliance with the specific standards established by the SEC and if the financial statements are inaccurate, the whole economy is going to suffer because resources may be allocated to less productive activities. This reduces economic growth, reduces investor confidence. It's just not good. Exhibit A, Enron. If you haven't watched the documentary about that, I highly recommend watching it. It's called the Enron, The Smartest Guys in the Room. It's based on a book, reporters Bethany McLean and Peter Elkind wrote when they were investigating one of the largest business scandals in America. So it's fascinating and just very interesting to see what kind of regulation came about because of that. So, in 2002, we had the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. We also had the Dodd-Frank Act in 2010, Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection. These involved legislation to reform regulation of the financial system. Sarbanes-Oxley specifically required disclosure of conflicts of interest from auditors in order to increase transparency and ensure that um, confidence is maintained in the financial system. So, as far as that goes, again, I didn't want to spend too much time in this chapter, but there are quite a bit of these terms that you see coming up in the news recently. So with that being said, hopefully this kind of shed some insight on what's happening. If you have further questions, just feel free to let me know. Thanks.